Ladies and gentlemen, our guest tonight is Penny Langford Freeman. She was political director for Ron Paul from 1998 to 2007. Quite an old hand in the liberty movement. She really has done an incredible job from behind the scenes supporting so many liberty candidates. She works now as a political consultant in Texas. But she's on the show tonight because of her understanding of Ron Paul Inc. and is going to help answer a lot of the questions that people in the Ron Paul movement have about what's going on with the campaign, Ron Paul's personal implications for that as well as his family implications, and what it means for the movement going forward given that we have seen such turmoil in Ron Paul Inc. as of late. We've seen the outing, I guess I would call outing of so many leeches around Ron Paul, Jesse Benton, John Tate, Doug Weed, all of those involved in the campaign. She has some very unique insights to share as to what may be behind all of that. And we're very grateful for her coming on Adam vs. the Man for her first media appearance on this subject in, in something that I, I'm just... Penny, I don't, I don't even know what else to say in introducing you, but I'm, I'm so grateful that, uh, that, that I have this opportunity to share your wisdom and your perspective and your insider information with the rest of the movement. Thanks, Adam. I, you know, the reason for me coming on, I, I like to stay under wraps, um, and I don't make a habit of talking about or destroying hope or, uh, you know, taking people down. I, I like to build up people and give them hope but there's a lot of truth here that needs to get out because I don't want the movement to be fractured I want us to be a cohesive family and there are a lot of things going on that <clears throat> tr truthfully um, need to be explained and from my perspective living down here and seeing what's been going on for several years now uh, it needs to be explained so that people can move forward with truth and you know usually when something like this happens people take it like it's a devastating blow and on face value it may seem that way right now but i can see that there are things going on with our growth in the movement that these things need to happen you know we need to see um, who is going to ca carry the message consistently. We need to see who is going to fall and cave in to the establishment because it is a very real uh, and very lucrative uh, heady power game that we're playing with here. So, um, you know, go ahead and ask me well, first, what you want to know. Well, first, when you say devastating blow, do you mean... Ron's concession after having seen so many mistakes in the campaign and so much potential squandered or are you referring specifically to what happened just last night Rand Paul going on Sean Hannity and endorsing Mitt Romney well I think that that's uh, it's been going on for a long time you know people have been wondering you know why is Jesse Benning, Benton coming on to the media and saying we know Ron's not going to win or we're doing this to build the party or we're uh, we're not going to be campaigning in Florida or we're not spending any more money on a campaign those things have raised a lot of questions and those things are not conducive to and even giving your strategy to uh, the world is not conducive to a true grassroots decentralized campaign. Well, so, well I, I, have, I have a feeling we are going to go on a little trip back in, in time here in political history and, and have a real examination of everything that's gotten Ron Paul and the movement to where it is today. But let's, let's sort of do this in reverse chronological order then, starting with the most recent. Why did Rand Paul endorse Mitt Romney? Um, there's a lot of political capital uh, to be gained and to be given. Um, you have this multi-million dollar list that his father has accrued over time. And it's very valuable. 
and the neocons and the establishment want that. And if they can't have that, they want that power to be neutralized because the very first thing that a candidate has to have is an ability to raise funds. Um, and if you neutralize that ability, or if you water it down, uh, then you co-opt the movement. And I believe that that is what's going on here. If you see the movement of the RNC um, after Rand won that primary and how they sent Trig V. Olson in, and Justin Raimondo wrote a very, very good article uh, talking about Olson a as very, his... Very important as, background. The link to that article will be in the description. Well, people need to understand that. I mean, here we are fighting a megalith government. Hold on, hold on, Penny, though. Before, before we get to Trig V and, and the background here, you're, you're still avoiding the central question here for Rand. Why? Why did he make the choice then to side with the establishment? I don't want to say over his father, because I think it's assumed that this was done with some planning and coordination. Obviously, it wasn't a spontaneous thing, but certainly... Uh, against the movement. What do you? Why yes. political capital? I mean, he's got the foot. He's got his foot in the door. So you're saying that Rand Paul, unlike his father, is willing to either compromise his principles or doesn't have the same principles in order to further his political career. Sure. Sure. Okay. I mean, who wants to be senator when you can be king? Okay, and you, and you think that's that's all it is for Rand that he's just simply not uh, not just not at the same philosophical standard of his father, the same ethical, moral, liberty principle stand as his father, but he's also not as honest or committed to whatever his own principles may be. That he's just, he is a typical sellout. I don't think he's typical. I think that. Olson as he set out to do. If you have an enemy, you find their sweet spot, their weakness, and then you go in and you neutralize it by watering down their abilities to raise funds and give a clear message. Okay, so working back in time now, how did Trig V. Olson come into the picture? The RNC sent him there when he won that primary. So this is back to Kentucky, 2010. Mm -hmm. Rand wins his primary against the former Democrat GOP establishment choice. And they send Trig V. Olson to be the adult in the room. Their words, that was what, what was actually published mm -hmm. as, as their strategy for why they sent Trig V. Olson in. But, but why him in particular? Because he is the neocon regime change specialist. He's worked in countries all over the world to do this. On he of, is their guy. On behalf of whom? on behalf of the neocon establishment, the military industrial complex, those who will have their wars. Okay, so for our viewers, be more specific if you would then, and what is it about Trig V. Olson's resume that puts him in a different category, that has you uh, condemning him outright? Because he has worked for um, the Bush regime, you know, just about every one of these uh, neocons going back for decades he has worked for them and you know we don't have time to lay it all out but if you go if people go to that Ramondo article he lays it out okay you know? and, so and, and if you go and if you go to uh, his consultant he's a quote unquote political consultant and his consultant firm's name is Viking Strategies um, he worked for Rand, and then Olson is the one who suggested Rand bring in Jesse Benton, because Jesse Benton is part of Ron's weakness, his family. So, hold and, on, hold on, hold on. This is, this is a new angle that I didn't really understand before. You're saying that Trig V. Olson was sent by the establishment to Rand Paul essentially before Benton came on and what he did was convince Rand 
to grab Benton out of everything else he was doing for Ron, make him the campaign manager, and has been blowing up and promoting Jesse Benton to Ron in order to make that weak link, that weakness of, of Ron Paul's own nepotism, Jesse Benton being the grandson-in-law, that that has been part of his grand plan, that it wasn't Jesse Benton as the primary actor here, that it's really Trig V. Olson is the meddler behind the scenes, and in a sense, Jesse Benton is a pawn of the Trig Patsy. V. To right. Trig V. Olson. So, uh, but, I mean, certainly a corrupt individual, and, a greedy, self-serving individual, but the, you're saying the man behind the plan to subvert Ron Paul, Inc., and to take away its non-interventionist message's teeth was Trig V. Olson. Yeah, he's the guy who knows what to do and how to neutralize, how to neutralize power. Okay, and now... Jesse, Jesse Benton is like, you know, he didn't even know who Ron Paul was in 07. Okay? And he obviously neither... I mean, I, I don't know anybody on their staff who actually knows how to run a true dis decentralized grassroots campaign. I mean, okay, let me give you an example. All right? 30 years of experience in name ID. 10% in his own state. Deborah Medina ran for governor, first time she had ever run for anything besides her own county chair, and got 18% in this state with $880,000, got over 250,000 votes because she ran a true decentralized grassroots campaign. You know, Ron Paul getting 10% in his own state with 30 years of political capital and a massive amount of money. Deborah Medina came in ran for governor her first time ever, got 18% in a state, got 250,000 votes with under a million dollars, $880,000. That's about $1.71 per vote, okay? Well, we're, we're going to come back and, and get your take on Ron, uh, whether or not he's actually running to win, given some obvious perspective like that. But just to get back to the Trig V. Olson thing, because there's one other major part of this that we haven't covered yet. Trig V. Olson has now received over $200,000, at least through Viking Strategies, from the Ron Paul presidential campaign. And are, are you suggesting that Trig V. Olson blew up Rand Paul, blew up, more importantly, Jesse Benton, gave Jesse Benton credit for the victory in order to get Jesse Benton taken on as, as, uh, in a high position as possible within the presidential campaign so that he could bring Olson in as, as a payback and allow Olson, uh, perhaps with or without Jesse's knowledge, to further subvert the Ron Paul presidential campaign. Yes, it's been a conduit. You know, he's acted, Jesse has been his conduit. And if you, and if you think back to that primary in Kentucky. That was a grueling race, mm -hmm. okay? Why would they take the campaign manager that brought them through that grueling primary knowing that Jesse has never run a campaign, he had only been a media advisor, and then put him in a leadership role in that campaign? Jesse has only worked in lobbyists and think tanks, okay? His first campaign ever was a media, the media contact for the 08 Ron Paul campaign. And now he's getting paid more than Karl Rove. <laughs> so let's go back in time, though, for a bit here and, and look at Jesse Benton coming onto the campaign in 2007. He's living with another woman. He ends up on the campaign trail, meeting Valerie Pyatt, Ron Paul's granddaughter, uh, ending up marrying her. Is, is there some failure in judgment on Ron's part in then giving Jesse Benton all of the promotions that he, he got even back in the 08 campaign? Um, of course, because a, a candidate always calls the shots. You know, he's the one that's... That okay, the checks. Um, even your daughter, Hasib's mother-in-law, is writing the checks. 
uh, he he bears the brunt. The buck, buck stops at the top. Okay, but also you have to remember that the people who had been um, around him for many years, care, you know, working through those twelve terms of of congressional campaigns, were for the most part gone. Okay. Um, Kent Snyder had never run a campaign before. In 88, I believe he delivered signs for his presidential campaign. Um, there was very little uh, long-term, um, there was no strategist. There was basically no experience on the team. You've got a bunch of young guys who um, think that you can win a campaign with Google ads, okay? which is not realistic. And so, you know, these these guys who Ron is thinking smart um, now are, instead of providing contact to the outside information, uh, build a wall around him and, and tell him what they want him to know. And you, this is why you see some of these really strange endorsements by uh, Ron Paul in 2010. By, by strange these... endorsements, we mean unexpected endorsements of non-liberty candidates. <clears throat> His dealings with uh, the Republican Party in Texas or the Republican Party in general agreeing mm -hmm. to not support anybody who's running against an incumbent Republican. Right. For years and years, we had a policy in that office of not entangling alliances and do no harm. You don't go in and make endorsements um, because it sounds good. You might do harm to people who have donated to your to your campaign and and been carrying your message if you make these endorsements in a primary because you can't know the heart and the message of each one of those. Okay, so that was our consistent policy, just like Ron's consistent foreign policy. You don't. The only way to do to be fair to all of these countries is to not give them any money, okay? And it's the same thing with these candidates. You don't go and pick and choose your endorsements because you don't know if one of them is CIA or Goldman Sachs, okay, well, like no, Ted Cruz is. Well, we, right, Ted Cruz being the most offensive recent example, but also uh, Ron endorsing Lamar Smith in 2010 was rather disturbing. All of those... Yeah, all of those incumbent Republicans who have no clue and no will to vote for liberty. Do you think this is Jesse Benton selling those endorsements behind the scenes? I absolutely think that because people offered me money. Ah, so not proven but clear evidence you do get paid off in some form or another. If, mm -hmm. if, if you make these endorsements, if the candidate takes charge and does it and understands the deal, then hypothetically Ron could be benefiting from all of this. But if they're bribing Jesse Benton saying, just send us an endorsement from Ron, then obviously it's not in Ron's best interest. But now we're back to, to 2007. But, but Adam, let me go a little bit further on that. Okay. Okay. Not only do you make uh, these campaign aides or whatever you want to call them, uh, not only do they make a down payment uh, into some consultant firms, which we know Jesse Benton has two of them, um, but if you do fundraising for them, you get a percentage of your fundraising ability as well. Say um, if Ted Cruz used the list, the multi-million dollar fundraising list of Ron Paul and an aide makes a deal to get 10 percent off at the top. You can see where that would be a very lucrative business deal. Absolutely. Well, now we're back to 2007 when, when you stopped working for Ron and I, I just have to give you the chance to answer the devil's advocate question here. Uh, wh how do we know that you're not just some disgruntled former staffer like Eric Dondero. And feel free to say whatever you want to differentiate yourself from Eric Dondero. For many years, Eric Dondero was like my arch enemy, okay? We did not get along at all. 
Um, I kind of felt bad for him because he had, um, well, you know, he, he was, uh, I don't know, you know, People well, just just for, pity, for the right? audience, for the audience here, Don Darrow was was actually fired by the Ron Paul uh, campaign, and he was a long time ago. Who used to work uh, for his his office in Texas, and has since come out condemning Ron Paul for not being libertarian enough because he's not aggressive on foreign policy. I mean, the guy really is pretty twisted, and the epitome of a disgruntled former staffer who thinks that it's libertarian to police the world. But that's kind of an aside here. Penny, but tell us about how your relationship, your, your, your formal working relationship with the Ron Paul campaign and whatever capacity you were involved with came to an end. Well, um, early on, we had a staff meeting and we were there were going to be four consultants for that uh, presidential bid. Um, when Kent Snyder told me openly in a meeting that Ron Paul can't win, they will never let him win. Um, we're going to spread the message. I told him that I don't get paid not to win. I don't do that. If I am going to join a campaign, if I'm going to work on a campaign, it is going to be to win. Because getting a message out is not what we are getting paid for. And respect for the donors, just like taxpayers that pay a congressional employee, respect for the taxpayers means that you set out a goal, you have a strategic plan to carry out that goal, and you go in and you win it. And I would not participate in a plan that was not a strategic, that did not have a strategic goal to win. And I was um, very disheartened and very sad, but I couldn't participate in it. I saw a great potential if we actually had a true decentralized, and that means not top down, it means bottom up, grassroots campaign, we could have rocked this country. because. You know, getting a message out is amplified 10 times over when you're running to win. It is not a byproduct. I mean, it, it is not your main goal to get a message out. It is a byproduct of a win. And anything less is deceptive to campaign donors. But l let me ask then uh, about the nature of your, your personal relationship with Ron, because you're still in touch with him. You're still in contact with him. Um, what do, you, what do you think is going through his has, head right now? How aware is he of all this? Because that's really one of the, the million, one of many million dollar questions here is how much of this corruption around him within his organization is Ron Paul actually aware of? I don't know that. I don't know what he knows. I do know that there is an insulation. Um, I do know that anyone trying to get a hold of him hits a brick wall with Jesse Benton, yep. and there's a reason for that. Um, he's pro well, he's protecting him. Jesse, do you, uh, hold on just a second here. In terms of Jesse Benton's relationship with Ron Paul, I want to ask you, how much does he really have his ear? I, I, people have likened this to the, the, the king from the Lord of the Rings who has the evil sorcerer whispering in his ear and has him under his spell. Is, is that really the kind of power that Jesse Benton has over Ron Paul at this point? A man who's been in the campaign meetings has told me that Trick V. Olson always sits by Jesse Benton, whispers in his ear, and then Jesse pipes up with something that you know couldn't come from his brain. <laughs> That's, 
that's a nice way of uh, describing the limitations of Jesse Benton's intelligence. But also the family, the, the, the Paul family, what, what is their take on, on all of this? I know that there are members of the Paul family that call Jesse Benton the idiot in law. I know that there are members of the Paul family who were amazed and disheartened by uh, the endorsement of Ted Cruz. I know that there are members of the campaign staff that are disgruntled and amazed that so much power and influence has been concentrated into one human being. I know that the people of District 14 have been left floundering with two neocon establishment um, candidates to, to replace Ron Paul. Um, there's just a lot of things going on that you really can't know how much Ron knows. To I hope and I pray that he knows very little about this because the implications of him knowing are not good. What are they? The implications are that he has been participating in a scam of his supporters. Do you think that's true? Do you think he was never running to win and was deliberately deceptive in that and has allowed all of this to go on? I don't know. I know that his portfolio has grown. Well, that really is the million dollar question, isn't it? Yes, it is. Are you confident that he was never running to win? Because even, even as an outside observer, in, in the sense, relatively outside, this is probably why most of the mainstream media didn't take him seriously. They saw so many failures in campaign organization and wrote him off, in a sense, as they should have, as someone who is running an educational or message or fundraising campaign on behalf of Jesse Benton, and, and of course, and himself and the cause, as opposed to running to win. I think that more the reality is that there was um, there wasn't quite the confidence necessary in the message you know the message is so powerful that he was always so surprised and still is. You can see it on his face that he's always so surprised when he gets so many people in the room. And I think that he underestimated the power of that message. When he first was thinking about running in 07, I told him, this is the message that people live and die for. Do not be surprised when you have people that are willing to take your back and to cover your back and die for this message because that's what the founders did. This is what this message is what those students in Tiananmen Square died for. And so you cannot underestimate that power. Words are very powerful. And, and you know, he said, you know, I, the idea it is time for this idea and so if you have that message and you get out there and you run on this message on a national stage then you have to have the the confidence 
uh, and the ability to portray that message consistently. And he's done that for years and years. And I love him for that. And I've loved him like a dad, you know, worked 18 hours a day to further that message and have his back. Um, but you have to stay consistent and you have to have uh, a no compromise policy. You take no prisoners. You know, you can't carry a message forward that has been no compromise and then all of a sudden, you know, can't move it forward on compromise. It has to be no compromise all the way. And that means take no prisoners. And that means win. Well, hopefully Ron himself will have a chance to watch this video if it gets through the curtain around him that the, the Jesse Benton has lowered in, in attempting to isolate him from, from hearing things that challenge this. Uh, Tom Woods, just as another example of someone like myself who was thrown under the bus of Ron Paul, Inc. simply for criticizing in a, in a very open, positive, constructive way what Jesse Benton had been doing. What would you say to Ron if you, if you had his undivided attention right now? He hasn't been able to look me in the eye for a long time. If I had something to say to him, as you grab your son up and you tell him that you built a movement on this message and you never compromised this message, and it's time, if Rand is going to be the man to carry this message forward, then you teach him no compromise on principle. That's the only thing that's going to move it forward. You don't think and it's too late for Rand? I don't think. I don't. May, I don't think. I don't think he is any, anywhere near his father in terms of his his commitment to his principles, or let alone his, his understanding of maybe the not. But philosophy. he has the. Po you're right, maybe not, but he has the political capital passed down from his father. He has his list, he has his organizations, and now, if he's, now, going, to be, he if he's going to be steward of that, if he is going to be steward of that, if he's going to maintain it, if he's going to get the movement behind him, he, he's going to have to have the principle of his father. Otherwise, we will fracture and we will start working on local. Well, I think that's already the case, only, is that, that, that Rand has, has demonstrated, at least by his endorsement of Mitt Romney last night, that... And that may be, that may be the blessing <clears throat> of, of this um, endorsement, that people will stop having such an idolatrous affair with national politics and look to their local. Well, I think that that's going to be the, the <clears throat> blessing of that endorsement. It, well, it could also be that it, it's made it clear that Rand Paul is in no position whatsoever to even attempt to carry on the legacy of his father. That he may inherit some of the mechanisms, he may inherit this list, but the list is worthless. A list of liberty lovers who would donate to anything that Ron Paul puts his name on will not support his son who is now a warmonger and has endorsed Mitt Romney. You would hope not, but there's still, you know, there are <clears throat> sheeple out, out in the voting public and there are sheeple within the movement. Anything that Ron or Rand says, that's their God. They're not thinking. They can't, can't, they can't you know, use their uh, con common sense and say, you know, if you lay down with dog, you wake up with fleas, or if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then it's a duck. You know, they're not thinking in those terms, because people, it's in their, it's in their hum, uh, innate uh, humanity to want to follow instead of lead. Those people who will say, you know, uh, I'm not going to participate in this are you, you want to think that that is the mainstream or uh, the bulk of this movement, but is it? There will always be a segment of this movement that gets an email from Ron Paul and sends in their check. 
And those will be the ones who will support Rand just because his name has the similarity and right. he's, he's on that list. So in closing then, Penny, let me give you a chance. What, what, do, what is the lesson to be learned from this? What is the ultimate takeaway? And what is your message to the rest of the movement? The takeaway is, you know, never let failures of others steal your joy. I mean, there is a lot of joy to be had. And don't put all of your faith and all of your, um, all of your hope in man, because men are, men are fallible. They have weak spots. Um, you have to look towards doing something yourself. And you have to constantly be diligent and searching for knowledge. Don't close your mind to what your possibilities are. And for God's sake, don't do what you're fucking told, okay? <laughs> do not take orders from anybody. You think for yourself. You step back and look at the knowledge that you have and try to gain more and do what you think is right. Do not do what you are told. You are not a robot. Use your brain. Amen. And if you still need a leader, you might not be ready to be a part of the freedom movement. Ladies and gentlemen, Penny Langford Freeman, all the way from Texas, thank you so much for joining us. Please check the link to the Justin Raimondo article in the description below for the full backstory on Trig V. Olson. Keep loving, keep fighting. We'll see you in Tampa Bay, Florida. Thank you.